It's the weekend and you have financial questions that need answering. That can only mean one thing. It's time for Jill on Money, the show that takes the mystery out of your finances. Here's your host, Jill Schlesinger. Welcome, welcome. It's Jill on Money here on Super Bowl Sunday weekend. This is the program that takes the mystery out of your financial life. And we are broadcasting live from the Capital One Studios. Capital One, what's in your wallet? Super Bowl. This is actually the first season in many that I've actually that that I've been excited about the Super Bowl, Mark. Took a while. Well, Mark wants to know who I'm pulling for. I don't want anyone to get upset in our listening area, but you know. Obviously, Kansas City, because that Mahomes is some unbelievable creature. Is he not? Also, you know what? The Niners have won plenty. I like to spread the wealth around. I really do. It's going to be a great game. I hope everyone's going to enjoy it. Uh, As I said, this is the program that takes the mystery out of your financial life. You know what happened this past week? I know you are excited. Tax season. It's open. As of January 27th, if you need some information, I've got a big, bad blog post written about it. Just go to JillOnMoney.com, click on the read link, and you'll see that last weekend I put that up. There's not that much that's different about the tax year. I mean, obviously, every year there are inflation adjustments that are made. That happens to the income ranges around the tax brackets. That happens to the standard deduction. It goes up a little bit. That happens to a lot of the credits. They go up a little bit. But those are just minor adjustments. A couple of big things that are different. Uh, If you got divorced last year or you had an official separation agreement, the treatment of alimony has changed pretty substantially. So, again, this is only if this happened last year in 2019 and going forward. So if you have a divorce decree prior to 2019, old rules apply. But for the new people getting divorced, here's the deal. Alimony, when the check was written, it used to be that you would be able to actually claim that as a deduction. And then the person who received the alimony had to claim it as income. That's gone. It's kind of tax neutral now. So alimony, out the door, nothing. The other thing that is interesting is, you know, there's no individual mandate penalty anymore, meaning if you didn't have health insurance in 2019, the penalty dropped to zero and you don't have to file any forms. So that's pretty big deal. Those two things are the most important changes. Uh, The threshold for deducting unreimbursed medical and health care expenses, it was supposed to go up to 10 percent. It stays at seven and a half percent of your AGI. Not a lot of people are going to do that. Okay, let's start. I got to breathe a little bit. Let's start with the the way we love to start a phone call. Here is Jeff from North Carolina. Thank you, Jill. Well, um, my wife and I are, are in our mid-50s. Um, we're looking at uh, potentially retiring in the next uh, three uh, to four years. Whoa, wait, um, wait, wait, wait. What do you mean? Yeah. That you're so yeah. young. Well, it, it, you know, retirement has its advantages and probably um, doesn't necessarily describe it accurately. We're looking to get out of the rat race, more okay. or less, okay. and move to something that's, uh, that's much less stressful, I think. Okay. So you want to keep yeah. doing something. You just want to be in a position to choose what you want to do, right? There you, yes. Sounds yeah. great. Okay. Tell me a little bit about yourselves. Uh, you got some money saved up. How, mu- how much do we have? Uh, pensions, anything like that? W- what's in the calculation here for me? Okay, so I'm retired military, mm-hmm. and we're pulling a pension of about 54k a year. Right. Um, in addition, we have between our 401ks and our IRAs and the rest, we have about 1.2 million. With um, I think around 70 percent of that's in mutual funds. Uh, the rest are in corporate bonds. Okay. Um, have a home value of anywhere from four thirty to four forty, with a three and a half percent fifteen year mortgage of uh, just getting close down to around a hundred k left on that. Wow. 
Um, yeah, no other debt. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, had two great boys who are are out of the house and financially independent themselves. So that's a that's a good deal, yeah. right? Uh, yeah, and then in, in addition, we have a, a, our reserve cash fund of about 120k. Uh, and we're trying to suck away about 32, anywhere from 30 to 32 in cash every year, plus another 50k into our 403bs and 457s. Uh, mm-hmm. So, um, how much do you think you need to live on for real? Um, we've calculated out. Uh, I'm a, a, a Quicken guy, so we've calculated out of our, our expenses in Quicken to be roughly uh, anywhere from 110 to 120 a year to be very comfortable. Okay, net, yeah. not gross. So, in other words, Gr- no, that's gross. That's yeah. gross. Okay, so yeah. the 54 is your pension, about half covered. I know this is like fantasy land, so who knows? But like. If you had to project and you get out of the rat race, how much money do you think you'd like to count on in terms of like, oh, between the two of us, we'll make blank. How much is that? I would think we would probably be looking to get anywhere from 30 to 40 K a year between the two of us. Okay, that sounds good. So it seems to me like you can actually do this, because if I looked at just, you know, one point two million, by the time you actually pull the pull the trigger on the retirement, I presume it's going to be more like one and a half million will be in there. I mean, unless we have a complete meltdown and no recovery. I think numbers wise, you make it. Okay. Okay. Here's what you have to worry about. And, you know, let's just presume that you're 59 and a half and you can take this money out. And, you know, you say, I really don't want to start pulling money out right now with the market down. It's just a bad time to do that. So in that case, what I would say is, you'd have to kind of make an audible call at the, at the you know, game of time call where you right. would say, you know what? Market stinks. I'm not blowing out just yet. I'm going to keep the money coming in. I like the fact that we can, you know, we're putting money away. Let's just delay this for a year. That is a, the only time I would say that, you know, you would almost be doing market timing, which is it is better to retire when the market is up than down. Because what we know is that if you retire and you start pulling, let's just say three grand or four grand a month out of your retirement accounts to fund the gap between what you need, the military pension and whatever you guys make, that that is not a great time to do it. So do you think you guys could be flexible enough to make that call down the line? I think we could be very flexible. I think uh, probably we'd start to move, uh, shift uh, uh, some of our portfolio away from maybe the market and into some uh, more uh, safely structured uh, corporate or or, uh, uh, bonds in that manner. But I think we could be very flexible. And if we had to stick around for another year or two, we we certainly could do that. You know what you might find also? I've heard from people who do this same exact calculation that you're doing. And what they will find is that as soon as they actually figure out that they can retire comfortably and get out of the rat race, they sometimes stick around a little bit longer. But I think you're going to be okay. And as long as you have that, as long as you know in the back of your head, nah, remember what Jill said, then I think you're in good shape. Great. Well, I appreciate that. Okay, we'll be back in just a minute. During the break, why don't you head on to JillOnMoney.com. You can sign up for our free weekly newsletter. It's free. Okay, gang? It's great. Mark does it every Friday. All right, we'll be right back. Back to Jill on Money, where Jill Schlesinger helps you take the mystery out of your finances. You're back. It is Super Bowl weekend. I don't know who. We got to probably have some scary music. Don, 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 don. What's the music for the Super Bowl? Oh, I don't know. Whatever Fox's theme is, I'm not sure. Anyway, this is the program that takes the mystery out of your financial life. No, I'm not talking about all the different weird things about Super Bowl indicator. It doesn't matter. It's stupid. I'm done talking about that. You are here to hear other people's issues, your own issues. If you've got a question, ask Jill at JillOnMoney.com. Let's go to Katrina in Colorado. Thanks so much for having me, Jill. Um, So kind of, I guess, the situation, as it were, or um, piece of advice we're looking for is my partner and I were 
thinking about, we've been a, a one car family for a long time. Um, and we're thinking about getting, getting a second vehicle and we wanted to pay cash. Um, so we're just kind of, our discussion is trying to figure out where to get that money from. Mm -hmm. Um, so if we should pull it from like his bonus or, um, we have some stock investments. So if, if that's okay. better. So tell um, me a little bit about yourselves. Please, First of all, how old are you guys? So we're both 30. Oh, yeah. Very nice. And, yeah. um, you're both working right now. Mm -hmm. So we're both working. I'm I'm more working kind of part time. So I think it's probably like our income's probably a hundred grand between the two of us. Mm -hmm. um, that's steady. Okay. Um, we also just bought a house. Ooh, so congratulations! About, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Thanks. Kind of a lot of a lot of changes happening all at once. So that's a lot, huh? More, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So we're just trying to um, you know make good decisions, think think long term, and and uh, be informed. All right. So, so 100 grand a year, you bought a house. How much did you pay for the house? Um, 360, 360. 360. How did you finance that? What kind of mortgage? So it's a 30 year fixed um, interest rate is 4.875. Hmm. That's a little high, but I see because of just the yeah. timing of it. Okay. Um, yeah. How much did you borrow? So right now, outstanding on our mortgage, we have 279 um, And you are, are you accelerating the pay down or just making the payments that are required? Yeah, we're trying to accelerate it kind of in the early stages right now. But OK. Um, All right. That's cool. Yeah. That's cool. We're going to get to that in a second. Um, OK. Tell me a little bit about the cash in the bank, like an emergency reserve fund. What do you have? Great. So that's the other um, thing we're thinking about for our down payment. We used a lot of our. Um, emergency fund and, and our savings. So right mm. now we're down to about 1500 Um And then, yeah, yeah, I know. And then for, um, I think we have about two grand in the HS, in an HSA as well. So Okay. Um, and did you say that you had money in stock? Mm -hmm, what? Yeah. Tell me about that. That's in a brokerage account? Yeah, yeah. So I think it's kind of just like mostly mutual funds. Um, it's something that I inherited a while ago, and it's probably around, I don't know, 560 right now. So it's a decent amount. So but it's just something slow down, that... girly. Hold on one <laughs> second. 560 yeah. as in 560,000? Yeah. You kind of glossed over that. That is what we call yeah. in my business burying the lead. Who's managing that account for you? Are you doing it yourself? Um, no, I just kind of selected some different some mutual funds with with um, it's on Vanguard. Oh, okay. So it's a Vanguard account. When did you inherit this account? It would be like 15, 10, 15 years ago. So it was a long time ago. So um, and I just you've got a ton of set it and forget and, it. And you've got a ton of gains in that account, correct? Yeah. There are no yeah. losses anywhere in that account. Probably kind of through time as the markets change, but okay. um, nothing, nothing significant. Okay, no. not a problem. Now, tell me mm. about the retirement stuff that you guys have done. And are you yeah. are you putting money away into a Roth because uh, part time usually you don't get a retirement account to contribute to? Is that so what are you doing? Yeah, so I, I am not. Uh, my husband is. So I think he's got about 30 grand in his Roth 401k and just about five grand in his R IRA. Okay. Um, so that's the other thing, too. We were we'd want to max both of those out. Um, definitely. Definitely. Okay. So here's what you're going to think about. A couple of things. Let's do your priorities. Mm -hmm. Stop making extra payments on that house. Okay. On the mortgage, rather. Just stop doing so, that. I know that. Yeah, it's, just pay, pay the minimum. Pay the minimum. Pay what you're supposed to pay because we're going to do some, we got some business to take care of with you guys because we want to look at your cash flow and to get a real sense of your cash flow, now that you've bought the house, making those extra payments kind of starts to give us a distorted view of your cash flow. So first mm -hmm. things first, stop doing that. You know, it would be better if instead of you paying down that mortgage, if you could take that money and use that extra cash flow so that your husband can max out his Roth, his Roth 401k, and you mm -hmm. can start a Roth IRA yourself on your income. And let those accounts just jam. Far better to do that than to put money down on that mortgage. Just completely, okay. it's a great do for you guys. Okay? Next, we got to replenish your emergency reserve fund. I know that the mm -hmm. brokerage account probably has a lot of embedded gains in that account. 
what I'd love for you to do is to take a look at that account, see if there are any losses. Maybe there's just like some loser in there and you want to take some of the money out of the loser if you have one and then actually put that against any winner. So if like one fund has a small loss, one fund has a small gain, sell enough of each that there's no tax change and that goes into your emergency reserve fund. If there are no losses that get you there, what I want you to understand is you guys are in a low bracket for long-term capital gains. It's not a definite, but I think that more likely than not, tax rates are all going to go up. You guys don't have kids yet, do you? No, yeah, I don't think so. I don't think that's in the plan. All right. Good. You'll be richer for it. I mean, you know, this money is the money that's in this Vanguard account is really interesting to me because what it does buy you is tons of opportunity. And I don't Mm -hmm. want to I know that you want to set it and forget it, but let's look at it and make sure it's now consistent with where you are in your life. That to Mm -hmm. me is a really important piece of the process. But that you got the game plan right now. Stop paying extra on the mortgage. Use that cash flow. Really look at those retirement accounts, max out a Roth IRA for yourself, max out the Roth 401k and the Roth IRA for your husband. And then we want to make sure we replenish the emergency reserve. And in that process, let's be really clear about the risk you have in the brokerage account and making sure that the allocation is in line with your goals and your risk tolerance. And that to me is where you go. You're in fantastic shape. For yeah. the, remember the original question about the car? Yeah. Forgot about that, didn't you? No, I didn't. Um, <laughs> I, I, I did. would. So what's his bonus for that we're talking about? Um, pre-tax, it's 75000 I think. I would take the bonus money. I mean, it, it depends. It depends what you end up doing with a brokerage account. It could come out of the brokerage account, or you could just use the money from the bonus. Uh, you haven't maxed out the retirement account, but I think that the whole, the bonus and, and the Vanguard account kind of come into play here, which is if there are no gains and you don't want to pay taxes this year, then I might use the bonus to buy the car in cash. I think that probably the bonus and the the conversation around the bonus and the brokerage account happens simultaneously. We see what's available but you're mm-hmm. going to pay cash either from the bonus or from that Vanguard account for the car. Mm-hmm. And it's really just a question of, you know, how much of a tax gain you want, to, how much of the tax bill you want to pay in the Vanguard account, how much we have to put into the Roth and all the contributions. I think you probably could do pretty much everything at once, but it's not going to all come from the bonus. You're going to have to tap into that Vanguard account to do everything you need to do. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense, too, for setting aside savings as well. Yeah. You know, because it. It's a drag to find yourself at a time where you must have access to money. And I would rather, uh, you know, I'd rather have you be more in control of when you replenish that account, because if an emergency Mm -hmm. arises and the market happens to be down, it would stink to have to then sell something at a place where you Mm -hmm. wish you had done it earlier. So let's pay the taxes that are due and get all of those boxes checked in terms of emergency fund, maxing out retirement and then making sure the allocation is right in line with where you want to be. Okay, when we return, we're going to get to more of your questions. Hey, during the break, when you're on JillOnMoney.com, our website, if you've got a question that pops up, just click upper right-hand corner, the contact button. So easy to do. Check it out. JillOnMoney.com. We'll be right back. Four hundred one ks, IRAs, refinancing. She covers it all. Back to Jill on Money with Jill Schlesinger. You're back. It's Jill on Money. And before you get sucked into Super Bowl madness, let's try to figure out what's going on in your financial life. Hopefully, you didn't bet the farm on the game, right? I never bet on the Super Bowl. I never bet at all. Actually, I'm the biggest wimp. I do not like gambling. Unless, for some reason, I were the house. If the odds were in my favor, I might like gambling. But when the odds are against me, not so much. If you need some help managing your financial life, you need to get prepared for tax season, why don't you get in touch with us? So easy to do. All you have to do, all it takes is just 
sending us an email, ask Jill at jillonmoney.com. Or maybe you've been on the website. Our website is called Jill on Money. How convenient. And uh, what you what you do is just click on the button in the upper right corner, and then we will hopefully be able to get your question answered. Okay, let's start to do some of these questions. Uh, this is from Sandra who says, and wants a question about the stretch required minimum distribution. And she says, I'm confused. Right now, I'm forced to take a required minimum distribution within five years of my mother's death, and I have two years left. Hmm, no. You, I don't think that you did. Those were the old rules. That five-year rule is the old rule. So you had the ability to stretch out your required minimum distribution. She says she has two years left. I think that you can probably continue as if it were 10 years from when she died. But I also think that you might be grandfathered in under the old rule. So what I would do is I would talk to the investment house that holds the retirement account just to get clarity on what applies to you. Michael says he did his first required minimum distribution in November. And he said, uh, because he got a notice from his retirement system. And he said, a friend was telling me I had to do this and that with it. And I turned 70 and a half. And I told him, I didn't think it was a type of account until I received the notice this year. He says, so I was wrong. Then he says, I came across a notice from August 2018 on the firm's website. Here I never noticed it until now that I was supposed to do my required minimum distribution by the end of 2018. They never mentioned that I missed doing one in 2018. And when I did this years, I just realized it. What should I do? All right. So here's what you need to do. I think what you need to do is probably talk to a tax preparer. You may need to go back and amend this. You've got to at least talk to a human being either at the place that holds your accounts or get someone else, a third party involved. If you missed a distribution and you can kind of fall on your sword and say to the IRS, like, oh, I didn't realize it and I'm so sorry and all those things that we always do, hopefully they can waive the fee. Because if you were supposed to take a distribution and you didn't take it, there's a huge penalty. Okay. Hiam writes that he watches me on TV. That's kind of cool. I always watch you uh, and I would appreciate your expertise. I'm almost 70 and my husband is 62. I retired 10 years ago for physical reasons. My husband is planning to retire next year. He is a cardiac anesthesiologist and he's got some medical issues. Um, okay. So he said he's worried that he's got another two years before he can receive Medicare. That could be a problem. And she says, in my opinion, I think we can afford private insurance to cover those two years. Um, okay, so here's what they got. $2.3 million in pensions. Wow. 900 grand in cash. $400,000 in an account with Schwab. Must be just a plain old brokerage account. An apartment worth 1.7 million, 200 grand in real estate and annuity. No other debts. Um, we've got kids, grandkids. Uh, my husband hates the winters here in the Northeast. We would like to maybe go to a warmer place. Should we buy? Um, okay. You should be able to afford your own insurance. That's not going to be a problem. It may kind of hurt in uh, your crush your soul to pay as much as you're going to have to pay, but that that's not the point. You've got ample assets. I don't know exactly how much money you spend, but you know, from what you describe, it doesn't seem like there's an issue. I would definitely not tell you to go buy a place in Florida or Arizona. I would first rent there. See if you really like it. You don't know. If, if you were going to take the step to buy, I, I would really think you would need to be very clear that you love this thing. You know, I devoted an entire chapter in my book to this exact scenario, which is people who are getting ready to retire that they buy when they really should rent. And I'm, I love renting. So I think go ahead, buy your private insurance. And um, maybe even if, if your husband can get some sort of insurance through an association, that could be helpful as well. So give that a, a, a try. Uh, I think you guys are going to be fine. Uh, okay. Wally says, let's see, I heard pros and cons about when to take social security. looks like the scale was tipped towards holding off for future benefit of the spouse in that case. You made one comment about what you could do with the money between now and age 82 and 83, but it was general. 
we're right now at the decision point. We'd like to hear how this might play out for someone similarly situated, but with some debt to pay off, such as a home equity loan of 40 grand. It might be better to take the social security early and pay that off and other debt than um, retire. Okay. Um, here's what I think. I, I still would like to know more about what's going on. Um, I don't know why you're paying off a home equity loan. That does not make sense to me because I don't know what the rate is. Um, I need more information. So Wally, I generally would say that if you had huge amounts of debt at much higher rates than what I bet your home equity loan is at, then maybe. But I, it's hard for me to make that case right now. So I'm going to stick to my, if you can wait, it's better to wait. That's the thing with social security. I mean, look, if you tell me when you're going to die, I'll tell you what to do. But we still have to pay, play the odds. And unless you have a really good reason to take that money early, it's just you get that 8% increase every year for waiting. So I would much prefer to wait to claim my Social Security retirement benefit than not. So if you can do it, you can wait. Or if I'm missing something and there's something more in your financial life that you didn't let me know about, send us a note. We'll, we'll get back to you. Okay. So, all right. What are you going to do now? I'll tell you what, during the break, go to jillonmoney.com. And why don't you check out some of the stuff that we do outside of the radio show? We actually have a podcast, a sister podcast. It's called Jill on Money. You can get it at our website, jillonmoney.com, or maybe on Apple or Stitcher, or radio.com, Google Play, anywhere else you find your favorite podcast. Podcast, it's just like a radio show, but when you want to hear it. So check it out. All right, when we return, more of your questions will be right back. Back to Jill on Money, where Jill Schlesinger helps you take the mystery out of your finances. You're back. It's Jill on Money. Did you have fun during the break? I know I did. Eh, you know, it's, it's just always a, it's always a laugh riot here at Jill on Money. Mark keeping me busy. If you have a financial question, we want to hear from you. You know that. That is the premise of this program. We bring you great guests and entertaining folks, but really, we built the radio show as a resource for you. So if you need some help with something going on in your financial life, or maybe you just want to make a comment, or maybe you need something explained a little bit more, why don't you give us a shout? Just send us an email, askjill at jillonmoney.com. Engaged couple, Angelique and Nick, they're in their 30s. Okay, so she makes 93 grand a year, got some money in retirement. He's not employed at the moment, but will soon be making... This is a pretty big range, 50 to 90 grand a year, got some money in retirement. So the question here is, ready? Angelique says, can I self-direct money in retirement to invest in real estate syndications? If so, what are some good ways to vet the real estate group to make sure there are not crooks? Oh, brother. There are ways to invest in real estate inside of retirement. They are complicated. I would try to avoid this. In fact, what I would say is, why are you doing this? Why do you need to do this? You can invest in real estate doing uh, using just plain old real estate investment trusts. It's so much easier. And you don't have to vet anything. And the risk is lower. So I got a feeling someone came to you, tried to sell you something. I don't know. I am not sure that this is the right move for you. So I would tread carefully. All right. Susan writes, her husband's 62 years old, and she says he's the beneficiary of his mother's IRA account. He's been taking yearly required minimum distributions and claiming the income. Question, would this be eligible to make a QCD, a qualified charitable distribution, with the inherited retirement uh, proceeds, with the required minimum distribution proceeds? I don't think you can do that. I don't think you can do a QCT. I think you've got to be the owner. You can't be the beneficiary. So no, I'm going to say, uh -uh, that doesn't work. Pretty sure you've got to be the owner of that account and direct that distribution directly to a qualified charity. Okay. Lori writes, uh, my husband and I are fast approaching retirement within the next five to seven years. And we just started taking his full retirement money. I started mine at 62 
We plan to put this in our equity account, which will sit there and lower required payments, which is more than a savings account. We're selling our house. We're going to move to a new community with no school tax. At 70 and a half, our incomes should rise. Mm. Is there any way to calculate a future required minimum distribution? Well, first of all, the new SECURE Act means that you don't have to start taking distributions until you turn 72. So that's good. Uh, I'm not entirely certain why you took your social security at 62, but maybe you're not talking about your social security. You might be talking about your pension, but anyway, you can go and use a retirement calculator and just do it based on, on today. And you can kind of ballpark it a little bit. Um, okay. Hey, it's a Jill from Jersey. Um, so who says, I use Quicken for many, many years to download transactions from financial institutions and track our net worth. Quicken started to give me some issues a couple of years ago. Uh, so I searched for new software and I discovered Money Spire. I switched over at the beginning of this year. And of course, it has some glitches, technical support non existent. So once again, I'm searching for the perfect software. I'm hoping you can select a solution that has the following features download transactions and balances from financial institutions, PC, not web based non-cloud backup, simple interface, budgeting feature not needed, free or low annual fee. Uh, Mark, you got any ideas? I don't. I was going to, you know, I, I'm, I'm sort of like boring kind of quick and into it person, but uh, maybe uh, we'll I'll see if I can poke around. If I can find something, I'll put it up on the website, but I, I, I'm not sure there's a lot out there that falls into all those categories. I'm sorry, but thanks for reaching out. Appreciate it. It wasn't your go-to person this time. Um, okay. Uh, here we go. This is from Dave. His wife's 58. He's 60. They've got $1.7 million, half in retirement, half in non-retirement, no debt, everything paid for household income, 160 grand. They're going to work for a couple more years when he'll be 62 and a half. They're considering retiring, working a little. Household income should be 50 grand annually for a few years after that. They're going to have Social Security at 2,900 bucks, living expenses 4,500. I'm not fearful of expiring anytime soon. Both my parents live to 90. I'm considering taking Social Security around 63. I know you're a fan of taking it at 70, but I don't trust the government to actually have any money for us boomers in 10 years. Thoughts? Get over it. Wait to take your Social Security. There is no way, first of all, there's no like pot of money that someone's going to spend on your, your, not your social security. The system is fine. It's going to be there for you. Uh, Wait to take your money and stop making yourself crazy. People need to like start worrying about the things they can control. For example, if you're worried about your money, then keep working. How about that? And don't worry about social security going broke. It's not going broke. There's money. There is money there. And frankly, if you're over the age of 55, you hardly have anything to worry about because the government's very unlikely to do anything for people who are over 55. Hurry up. I hope I turn 55 sooner. It's the only time I actually said that, Mark, in my life. Uh, Okay. You're listening to Jill on Money. During the break, hop onto the website. It's jillonmoney.com. You can sign up for our free weekly newsletter. Mark puts this together every single week. It comes out on Fridays. It's so great. Give you a little cheat sheet of things that you need to catch up on. And if you've got a financial question, we're here for you. Just send us an email. Ask Jill at jillonmoney.com. We'll be right back. You're back. It's Jill on Money, and we are broadcasting live from the Capital One Studios. Capital One, what's in your wallet? Scott writes that he is 66 years old, and he is a retired firefighter. He's got a pension, and he says, I should receive a small amount from Social Security whenever I decide to take it. And then he says that he met requirements to receive spousal benefits. His wife's been taking her Social Security since 62. 
my question, am I eligible to receive spousal benefits? If so, will my social security be reduced if I were to collect on her benefits? So Scott, I don't think that's actually the issue. The issue here is like, if you are actually eligible to collect half of her benefits, you can do so. And then when you are ready to claim your social security benefits, if you're, and it's only half of what she gets, right? So um, if you're ready to claim for yourself and your amount is bigger than her half, then you'll just claim for on your record for the rest of your life. So my guess is that your benefit, your full retirement age benefit is probably more than half of her social security benefit, which she took early. Okay. I'm trying to see if I can get one more in. Yes. Before we finish up. Um, okay. I currently have $150,000 in money market funds uh, and uh, 50 grand for short-term use, a hundred grand for a longer term. Should I be putting that money into another Vanguard fund? Well, if it's for the long term, yes. Short term, no. So what I really need to know is when you talk about long term versus short term, what are you talking about? What is this money for? That will help us determine whether or not you should put the money at risk. And also, of course, this is very much predicated on whether or not you've got other assets and what else is going on in your financial life. So let me know. That would be really good information. But short-term money, you can always go to depositaccounts.com to smell around, see if you got some other options. Longer-term money, yes, a diversified portfolio of index funds might be good for you. But you need a little more information. Okay, that's it. That's the hour. During the break, hop onto the website, jillonmoney.com. Check out all the neat resources that Mark has put together. He's so hardworking, very earnest. It's great. Okay, we'll be right back. the weekend and that can only mean one thing you're listening to jill on money the show that takes the mystery out of your finances here's your host jill schlesinger okay it's hour number two here on super bowl weekend it's jill on money and we are broadcasting live from the policy genius studios Policy Genius is the easy way to compare and buy insurance. Just go to policygenius.com. All right, we've got a great guest for this hour because uh, this was a kind of a good get, Mark. I don't know how you got this guy. Did I wrangle him in the CBS green room? I don't know. I don't remember. But anyway, I really liked him a lot. Maybe I say that too often and then it does. it has no meaning. I like him. Anyway, Binyamin Applebaum, Binya. He is, uh, I have been reading him for a long time in the New York Times. He's a member of the New York Times editorial board. He writes a lot about economics. He also has written a book, and it's called The Economist's Hour, False Profits, Free Markets, and the Fracture of Society. Now, the good news is Binya has gone back in time and has been able to frame the entire history of United States and even European economics, so you don't have to. Isn't that great? He also is able to really clearly state the evolution of how economists came to power for basically the last, let's call it 40, 50 years. So, uh, of course, I'll always start with a very simple question, which is uh, he had a good job. Why do you get involved with writing? So here's our interview with Binyamin Applebaum. All right. First of all, why did you write this big fat book? You know, I got fascinated by uh, this revolution, this quiet, really important revolution that happened beginning in the late 1960s and the early 1970s, where economists begin to gain influence over public policy uh, and really to take control of the course of public policy and to reshape the way that government operates in our lives and as a result to reshape our lives. You start 
with a premise that these four decades, 1969 to 2008, that the evolution of economists, you sort of recounted through different economists. What was going on before that? Some schlub is like, it's 1930-something, I become an economist. What does that career look like for me? It was very different, and it's fascinating how different it was. Economists did not play a central role in policymaking. There was a professor of economics at Columbia, a guy named J.M. Clark, who complained to a friend that he was paid about as well as a good carpenter. Uh, I don't know how the carpenter felt about that, but Clark felt that he was horribly underpaid. Paul Volcker, when he was a young man, worked at the Fed basically as a human calculator, and he uh, went home for, from work one night and told his wife that he saw no prospect of getting ahead at the Fed, no prospect of building a career there because there were no economists among the leadership of the central bank. So, you know, it was a time when economists were a, a much smaller profession, a much more peripheral profession. Uh, there were things that they did, but they certainly were not in the halls of power. And so what happened after World War II? What was the reliance on economics and what did that mean in terms of public policy? So the world begins to change after World War II and for two basic reasons. The first is that government is just getting bigger. It's doing a lot of different things uh, and that expansion requires expertise to manage it. And economists first come into government basically uh, to help manage the complexity of government, to organize the way that government is spending money, to help figure out the best ways of pursuing new goals. One of those new goals is to maintain prosperity and to ensure that the economy is growing and people are benefiting. And pretty quickly, economists begin not just to work in the boiler room, but to come up to the boardroom and to set the course of policy, to begin to influence how government pursues that very important goal. Now, and, and some of it seems rather altruistic, that I want to help society through policymaking. And in the early stages, this is about income inequality or access or just fairness, right? The first economists who come into government believe profoundly uh, that hands-on management will improve economic conditions, that they can literally make the world a better place. And moreover, that one of the primary responsibilities of government is to ensure that people are broadly benefiting, that those at the bottom are better off, those at the top are better off, uh, that, that inequality is limited. How does that start to shift and who is the shape shifter? It's really during the 1960s that this paradigm begins to fall apart. There's like three decades of really strong economic growth after World War II. And as that begins to sputter, a new breed of economists really come to the fore. And they argue that the government needs to revive economic growth by taking its hands off the economy, by stepping back and relying on markets in place of bureaucrats. And really importantly, they argue that the very focus on inequality, on the broad distribution of, of wealth, uh, is a problem. It's getting in the way of economic growth. And if you want to maximize growth, what you need to do is let the chips fall where they may. Some people are going to get very wealthy, but you shouldn't worry so much about that because everyone will be at least a little better off. And that gospel is really what this book is about, uh, that set of ideas which really take hold beginning in the early 70s. Would you say that the architect of that, the first architect, because there were probably many, would be Milton Friedman? The most important figure in this revolution is Milton Friedman. He's this elfin libertarian who is, you know, <laughs> commands any room he walks into, even though he's often the smallest person there. He's this brilliant debater. One of his opponents famously says that it's best to debate Milton when he's not in the room, because if he's there, he's going to beat you. Uh, you know, sparkling wit, really good at breaking down economic concepts and this passion, the single minded passion for the idea that the solution to almost every problem in public policy is for government to get out of the way. And we should also note that his wife, was also part of this. It sounded more like she was sort of the silent partner behind the in the background, but also an economist, right? Yeah, Rose Friedman. They met actually in in uh, graduate school at the University of Chicago. They were seated next to each other by a professor, and a, a marriage ensued. It's actually fascinating how many of the great economists of the mid-century had these female partners who often did a lot of the work, had a lot of the ideas, oh, and shocking. got like 5% of the credit at most. <laughs> that hardly ever happens anymore. It's I'm very sure. hard to believe. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, exactly. So make the case for the embrace of markets. What was the theory behind it? What did it try to do and where did it fail? The idea was that growth was slowing down and it was slowing down because the government was meddling. Friedman basically said, look, imagine you're in a dark room and you're trying to get across it. Right now, what we're doing is kind of groping and 
taking each step and thinking about what comes next. But actually, the best way to get across a dark room, which is sort of the task of a policymaker dealing with uncertainty, is just to set a fixed course and walk in a straight line. You want to minimize the amount of decisions that you're making. You want to minimize the amount of complexity in the decision making. He said, for example, that the Federal Reserve should be replaced by a computer that just increased the supply of money at a regular rate. He said the best thing you can do is to stop causing problems and get out of the way and trust that markets will deliver better results than people. Where did that go awry? It goes awry at the very beginning. It begins with a misconception about the nature of markets. Markets are human creations. Uh, We make the rules. We set the boundaries. We determine the goals. And if you stop doing that, there's no such thing as a natural market, basically. Uh, It's just a market in which all of a sudden you've decided that, you know, the rules are now you can do whatever you want. And the rules are now that the winner gets uh, the lion's share of of the returns. And that's a particular kind of market. It's a kind of market that delivers huge inequality uh, and that actually doesn't deliver broad prosperity. And that's what we've seen over the last 40 years. We'll get back to our interview with Binya Applebaum in just a minute. During the break, why don't you go to the website, jillonmoney.com, And there, you can do all sorts of fun things. You can read, you can listen to old shows, you can watch videos, you can even get some cool resources. Don't forget, if you have a fantastic financial resource, send it to us. Send us an email, askjill at jillonmoney.com. We'll be right back. Do I invest here? Should I put my money there? Jill Schlesinger can help you. Back to Jill on Money. You're back. It's Jill on Money, where we have great guests that are really accessible to you. And uh, even if you did not like Economics 101, if you never took it, it doesn't matter because the impact of economists in our lives is pretty significant. And that's why it's wonderful to have our guest, Binyamin, we call him Binya Applebaum. Uh, He is a writer at the New York Times. He's also on the New York Times editorial board. He's written a book called The Economist's Hour, False Profits, Free Markets, and the Fracture of Society. In this segment, we're going to talk about the last part of that subtitle, The Fracture of Society. Where do we first start seeing inequality bubble up? from this market-driven thesis? It takes a little while to get going, but one of the earliest places that you see it is in the sphere of deregulation. So the Carter administration really begins aggressively to deregulate transportation. They start with the airlines. They bring in this eccentric but brilliant economist named Alfred Kahn to take apart the federal regulatory system for airlines. At the time, uh, where airlines could fly, how much a ticket cost, what sandwiches you could serve on airplanes were all decided by a board of bureaucrats in Washington, D.C., And Khan and the Carter administration said, no, we're going to open up the skies. We're going to let airlines make these decisions. So that's great for flying. It means that flying gets a lot cheaper. People today fly many times more often than people in the 1960s. The misery of the experience notwithstanding, (laughs) uh, we've mostly gotten what we want. Who gets hurt in this process are the airline workers. And Khan is very explicit about it. He says that one of his goals is to transfer money out of the hands of the workforce and into the hands of consumers. So that sounds great in in principle because almost none of us are airline workers and most of us are flyers. But when you start doing it across the economy in place after place after place, transferring wealth from the workers, uh, what you get is that everyone's making less money or stagnating economically, falling behind. Uh, And that pattern really begins to take hold. And that's really where you start to see these yawning gaps. How much of that is also just that things were cheaper overseas? There is no question that economists are not the sole creators of the modern world. There were forces at work that were beyond the control of any policymaker. Globalization spread manufacturing across the globe and with it, you know, equalized wealth so that people in poorer nations were benefiting even as middle and working class populations in the developed world were losing ground. I don't want to minimize that. What economists did have a heavy hand in was uh, the terms of that evolution. Uh, dictating that America pressed for change as quickly as possible, made relatively little effort to help workers deal with those transitions, 
uh, or to provide a safety net when they fell down. That's really where the problem is. It's not that economists created globalization or even unleashed it. It was coming. It was going to happen. But we chose to sort of tie our hands behind our backs in dealing with that process. And, and that's what was so painful. And, and right. And forgetting that there would be losers in each of these consequences, the group of losers kept getting bigger. Forgetting is the nice version. Economists actually said explicitly that there would be losers. The justification they offered is that as long as society was benefiting in the aggregate, then it was potentially possible to help the losers. The key point to there is potentially. They didn't mm. actually insist that those losers got help. They were willing to justify these policies on the grounds that those people could be helped. And the tragedy is that we didn't. And so, like, we almost look at, like, this, as you said, forces. You say, like, okay, well, now all of a sudden economists who are espousing these market theories are shaping public policy. And at the same time, corporations are forgetting sort of that the fact that they are chartered by a municipal organization or a municipality and that they have some, you would hope, allegiance to their workforce and the communities but then all of a sudden you sort of have the 80s, which is like, screw my workers, screw the community. We're just going to put shareholder value front and center. Did that come as a result of those economic policies or was that happening anyway? Milton Friedman writes a very famous article in the early 1970s uh, in The New York Times, actually, in which he argues that the sole responsibility of a corporation is to maximize profitability. And other economists are making a similar case. Now, I don't want to necessarily maintain that economists created this phenomenon. I think there's a complex interplay between the ideas advocated by economists and the self-interest of corporations. There's a very famous economics paper in the mid-1970s that argues that the corporation is the best form of capitalism. And at the bottom it says, sponsored by the Eli Lilly Corporation. <laughs> so, you know, there is a relationship here. And they basically, you know, are, are encouraging each other. One thing that's fascinating about that is that economists like Milton Friedman didn't always view big corporations as a good thing. If you go back to his early years, one of the very few purposes he thought government should serve is to prevent corporate concentration, to prevent the rise of big, powerful corporations. But by the 70s and certainly by the 80s, a lot of conservative economists had really made their peace with the rise of large corporations, came to think of them as allies. And yeah, I mean, our modern economy is very much shaped by the power of those large corporations. And politicians also just kind of bought into this. So you kind of recount through each administration is fascinating that it's almost like it's creeping incrementalism that, you know, Carter was sort of buying into it and Reagan was clearly buying into it. And even that when Clinton came in as this, you know, middle of the road Democrat, he's filled his administration with a bunch of people who are all like bowing at the gods of the markets. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, a couple in, in broad outline, a lot of people think of some of these changes in public policy as having been the work of the Reagan administration. And the story is just much more complicated than that. It starts earlier than Reagan. It was bipartisan to a very significant extent. And as you say, you know, the Clinton administration, when it comes in, really makes its peace with many of the major changes that had happened under Reagan and says, OK, this is now mainstream public policy uh, in the United States. I think by the end of the 20th century, I don't want to overstate this point, but the degree of difference in economic policy between the two major political parties has gotten awfully small, certainly by comparison uh, with the historical diversity. So let's do a little more recent history and let's let's start with the the Greenspan years of the Federal Reserve. So tell us what kind of economist Greenspan was. So Alan Greenspan is a fascinating figure. He he's an economist uh, who who went into private practice early on and made a fortune as an advisor to big businesses. He doesn't get his PhD until quite late in life. He's not really a theoretical guy, uh, but he has a deep understanding of politics and a deep understanding of how the economy works. He comes into office in the late 1980s as the head of the Fed. And from the outset, he says, I'm not interested in financial regulation. It wasn't that he thought markets worked perfectly, but he thought that regulation would make things worse. And so he he literally says, you know, he takes an oath of office to be the nation's chief financial regulator. And as he's doing it, he's saying in his own mind, this part I'm not serious about. He comes in and then that's the crash of 87. Didn't he come in right before the crash? Yep. OK, so the crash occurs. And what happens after that crash in terms of regulation? The Fed dives in and and fixes, you know, the immediate problem by pumping money into the economy, basically. So the Fed responds aggressively to the crash, adjusts monetary policy. The, the stock market picks back up. The economy barely feels the effect. So 
that crash is remembered on Wall Street, but it doesn't really show up in like national GDP data. And Greenspan's ability as a manager of monetary policy is really affirmed by that early episode. All right. So Greenspan's like light on the regulatory pedal. What are the things that he eases up and how is that set the stage for the financial crisis? So I think there's sort of two big areas that you want to be focused on. The first is that he is very supportive of allowing large banks to expand their lines of business, to enter into more and more areas, to become financial supermarkets. He's a big supporter of breaking down the barriers that were imposed after the Great Depression to sort of silo financial activity and to limit the size of the largest banks. He thinks these are outdated rules and he wants them to go away. Another really important area is, and and I think almost more important than breaking down the old rules, is that he really resists the creation of new rules. And probably the most important example of this is is the credit derivative space, where you have a new industry that's growing up ostensibly to offer insurance, credit insurance, uh, but in fact, underwriting large scale gambling. And Greenspan says we don't need to regulate it. In fact, fiercely resists federal efforts to impose even the most cursory kinds of regulations, like bringing transactions into daylight, insisting that transactions be recorded, uh, sort of the stuff that just allows a market to have some hope of regulating itself. And what you get is is just a, a black market, basically, in which nobody can see in from the outside. Uh, no one's quite sure what's going on. Innovation is happening very rapidly, and regulators are pretty much blind. We'll get back to our interview with Binya Applebaum in just a minute. Hey, when you are noodling around the Internet and you're maybe getting yourself worked up about something, isn't it easier just to send us an email about a question that you might have? Just do it. Ask Jill at jillonmoney.com. We're happy to help you out. Okay, we'll be right back. Four hundred one ks, IRAs, refinancing. She covers it all. Back to Jill on Money with Jill Schlesinger. You're back. It's Jill on Money. It is Super Bowl weekend. I know that. I hope you didn't make a big wager. The whole idea of betting on games has taken on such a massive part of the the watching of the game. Maybe it's because betting is more accessible now. Not in New York, true, but it is accessible. One time when I was a young uh, trader... In on the commodities exchange, we did like one of those Super Bowl. Uh, what's that called with a chart, Mark? I forget what it's called now. But anyway, somebody won, and it said Jill, um, Jill from Gold Options, and they meant the clerk. I thought I won, and it was a hundred grand in 1988. So it was real money. But anyway, it was not me. Ah, <sighs> just a number of disappointments in my life. Okay, let's get back to finish up our interview with Binyamin Applebaum. He is the author of The Economist Hour. We're talking about the financial crisis in this last part of the interview. As the financial crisis hits, we have a a new regime. It has now shifted. Greenspan has, when was Greenspan's last year? 2006. Okay, so now we get the Ben Bernanke area. Tell us about Ben Bernanke. So Ben Bernanke is a guy who has studied the Great Depression. He's a scholar of monetary policy. He's a theoretical guy in a way that Greenspan never was. And his view of the Great Depression, which is a very influential view, is that what went wrong is that the financial system was allowed to collapse, that when you lose a bank, you don't just lose, you know, its ability to make loans, you lose its institutional knowledge of its customers. And no replacement institution is going to be able to lend to the same extent or with the same confidence. And that's some of what causes the economy to contract. So Bernanke is very focused on preventing the financial system from going down. And he pumps money into the economy to prevent that. Basically, you know, like offering transfusions to the banks until they stand up and start walking again. That is his absolute focus. But with the collapse of the economy, he also begins a reconsideration of the purpose of the Fed as an institution. Because under Greenspan and Volcker, the sole focus was really on limiting inflation, just getting inflation as low as possible and keeping it there. And they insisted that that was sufficient to produce stable and steady growth. And for a while, it seemed like they were right. But 2008 made it impossible for people to take that idea seriously. And so Bernanke and his successors really needed to grapple with a broader vision of what the Fed is supposed to do. I always think the Fed has three main jobs. One is as a regulator, right? That's the biggie. And then we have this thing called the dual mandate. So when did the dual mandate, which is essentially 
have an economy that has enough jobs so that if everyone wants a job, gets a job, and keep inflation low. When did that come to be? So the Fed is created in 1913 basically to prevent and to fight financial crises. That is the original purpose of the institution. And over time, as you say, it gains this other purpose, which in time becomes even primary. And it's basically the same history that we've just talked about. So after World War II, the idea that the government is responsible for minimizing unemployment becomes prominent in public discourse. At first, the Fed is regarded essentially as irrelevant to that project. It's a fiscal policy project. Uh, but Milton Friedman is really the person who succeeds in convincing policymakers that actually fiscal policy is the wrong way to address those issues. The only government entity that can meaningfully regulate economic activity is the Federal Reserve, and its focus should be on regulating inflation. So through the 60s and the 70s, you have this debate in public policy in effort to sort of make the law of the land that the Fed is responsible for dealing with unemployment and inflation, and then a battle inside the Fed that's ultimately resolved in favor of uh, minimizing any responsibility for unemployment and just focusing on inflation. In the aftermath of the financial crisis, who is the champion of helping the people? There were a lot of economists making that case. I think in the hour of decision making, there wasn't enough debate about the need to help people. There was still this, the, the policymakers with whom Obama surrounded himself were mostly indoctrinated in this view that you know, that you ought not to go out and help people. They were very reluctant to take those steps. And in time, you get a newer generation of voices saying, listen, inequality in our economy is a fundamental problem. The debt burden uh, on many consumers is a fundamental problem. Uh, you know, we can't just fix the financial system and trust that it's going to produce broad prosperity. We need to reconsider what role government should be playing in the economy. And over the last decade, we've heard a generation of younger economists grounded in a much more careful analysis of data that has become possible because of computing power, you know, grounded in a much broader willingness to consider ideas from psychology, you know, and other fields, uh, really offering an alternative vision of, of government's role in the economy that I think is, is compelling and, and promising. This is slightly depressing, this book, I got to tell you, because there's a, there's a stat early on that I highlighted, which blew my mind. In the United States, growth slowed in each successive decade during the half century described in this book from an annual average of 3.13 percent in the 60s to 0.94 percent in the 2000s. And that's adjusting for inflation and population. What's the answer here as growth is slowing down and how can economists help make those slices of the pie a little bit more even? I think there are two answers, and maybe the way to frame it is to talk for a moment about the 1990s, which is a period that many people remember as the last era of really great prosperity in the United States. And it was, but in the 1990s, what we were basically doing is harvesting an orchard that had been planted in earlier generations. We had the most educated workforce in the world. We had made massive investments in the development of the internet, and we were able to reap the gains of those investments. What we were not doing in that period was investing in the future. We were no longer investing in education. We were no longer investing in research. We were no longer as a society constructing the infrastructure that makes it possible to prosper in the future. So the first part of the answer is that we need to be making those investments as a society. We need to take seriously the idea that government can make people's lives better, not necessarily so much immediately as in the long term. Uh, the second answer is that inequality is a problem. You know, one when you say that the book is depressing, I'm actually glad in a sense because I think most of the people who are likely to read this book are from the portion of the American population that's doing fine. And it's really important for them to get the message that a huge chunk of the American population is not. And it's getting worse. And that inequality is not only bad for those people, it's bad for all of us because it means that they can't produce and reach their capacity. And because it means that democratic governance gets harder. It, we the people is falling apart because we share less in common. And that's something we all ought to be acutely concerned about. So the problem is inequality. And the solution is public policies that are explicitly focused on reducing inequality. And I think those two paths have a lot of promise. Thanks so much to Binya Applebaum. He writes in The New York Times. He's on the editorial board. And his book is called The Economist's Hour, False Profits, Free Markets, and the Fracture of Society. Go check it out. All right. When we return, your questions to be answered. We'll be right back.
401ks, IRAs, refinancing, she covers it all. Back to Jill on Money with Jill Schlesinger. You're back. It's Jill on Money. I know you're getting so excited for the opening of tax season. It's around the corner. End of January. Get all those documents in. Even if you don't file early, it's so great to just get some of the paperwork out early. You know what I did, Mark? I got that big bag together where I take all my documents every year around tax season and I figure out what's going to get shredded, what's old, and I just go for the big cleansing purge. Fire up the shredder and get going. So check that out. This is the program that takes the mystery out of your financial life. And we would love to hear from you. Just email us, ask Jill at jillonmoney.com. That's what Paul did. Paul's 59 and a half, and he says, I have a home that is two thirds paid for that I bought at the low end of the neighborhood a couple of years ago. It seems to be rising in value. I have a couple of hundred thousand dollars saved in various accounts and brokerage accounts, in addition to the one hundred thousand dollars of equity that is in my home. I will have practically zero pension. I make about forty to fifty thousand dollars, um, where cost of living is sort of average. Uh, and can be somewhat inexpensive if you plan well. I'm single. I listen, Mark. He makes forty to fifty grand a year, and he saves ten to fifteen thousand dollars a year. The front entrance door of the home looks good, but might be better if it's replaced with something more energy efficient. In a nutshell, I'm not sure whether to invest this year's savings into a new front door, into the accounts, Roth, all this stuff. Uh, so, question. Because 2019 capital gains, it doesn't look like I will get any sort of tax refund this year. How should I allocate ten dollars to $15,000? Maybe I should just keep it in the bank, but the rates are so terrible. Well, if you have an emergency reserve fund, so if you've got enough money in the bank that 6 to 12 months of your living expenses, then you don't have to keep all of this money set aside in that account. But I will say that of home renovation projects, and you can go to Remodeling Magazine, or I don't know, it's probably remodeling.com. They do an analysis every year of the best pro, uh, projects to do in your home and what adds value. And a front door is one of them. Mark, uh, bathroom ceiling, not one of them as far as I'm concerned. Mark took on a home project, a home improvement project that's that's vexing him right now. So, Paul, if you've got that emergency reserve fund set aside, I say go for the new front door and call it a day. All right? Easy. Easy peasy. Okay. Donna writes, uh, I need some insight about investing. I've met with different brokers, advisors. I don't get a feel good feeling with them, from them. I'm on disability at the age of 55. And after everything is paid for, insurance, et cetera, it leaves me with a net of $1,750 a month. I've made out a very organized budget and it spends every last bit of that seventeen fifty on expenses. So good news, my mortgage is paid in full. I have no car payment, and I try to live below my means. I currently have ten thousand dollars in an emergency reserve fund. I like to have a cushion. I've got a total of sixty thousand dollars to invest. My intention is to leave this money alone until I turn over sixty five. But I also want to know that if I needed to take some of it for any reason, I'd be able to get access to it. I also would like to know what is the best way to make more money for me without taking that much risk. Is there such thing as investing without risk? Thank you, and I appreciate your help. Okay, so Donna, there's nothing that says there's no like magic solution where you can invest without risk. Investing in and of itself, is an inherently risky activity. That said, since you only have this $60,000, and this is all you have in your life, my suggestion would be to be very careful. So I like that you have 10000 in cash, but if you're looking at $60,000, what is the goal of the 60000 We just need it to grow faster than the pace of inflation. Now, that may seem easier said than done. Inflation is very low right now, but so too, as you said, are bank interest rates. So maybe what you would want to do is take some of the money and invest it and other parts keep it really safe. Maybe I would look at 
uh, depositaccounts.com for a high interest bearing savings or money market account. Some of the online banks are really great. And then with the other part of the money, I think that you should be looking at low cost index funds. And if you don't feel comfortable doing this yourself, you're going to have to find someone who can help you out. In fact, maybe the best advice I would tell you is that instead of going to an individual, because someone's going to say, going to try to sell you an annuity, maybe you should go to a place like Vanguard Personal Service Advisor, Schwab Intelligent Portfolio, um, maybe uh, uh, Betterment or Wealthfront. These are online investment organizations that will also give you financial advice, but you've got to communicate clearly that you cannot lose this money, that you can only risk a small portion of it. And if you were to do that, that would probably keep you out of trouble. And that's what I think we're trying to do, like get you a little bit of return, but mostly keep you out of trouble. Okay. Thanks so much. And if you've got any questions as a follow-up after you start investigating some of these organizations, don't hesitate. Just get back in touch with us. Okay. It's Jill on Money. During the break, why don't you go onto our website, jillonmoney.com. And there you can do all sorts of fun stuff. Don't forget, you can follow us on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, YouTube. The handle is at Jill on Money. We'll be right back. You're back. It's Jill on Money. Before we close out the program, we're going to take another email. I want to remind you that we have been broadcasting from the Policy Genius Studios. Policy Genius is the easy way to compare and buy insurance. Just go to policygenius.com. Okay. Martha writes that uh, she's 70 years old, divorced. She's making 40 grand a year um, along with $1,400 in Social Security, another $1,300 a month coming from an annuity payout. Uh, I own my condo. I'm debt-free. I've got a $15,000 car loan. So that's not exactly debt-free. Forty grand in index funds. Question. Going forward with a recession possible, should I sell my funds, put in a money market account, knowing I'm, need, I'm going to need to pay approximately $1,500 in taxes? Okay. First of all, what I would do is if you know you have to pay a tax bill, yes, absolutely, free up the money that you're going to need for anything over the next year. And since your investment accounts, you know, might be ready to be reallocated, maybe this is also a time to free up some of the money and pay down some of that car loan. Because if you really think a recession is coming, the best thing you can do is not necessarily sell all your investments, but to beef up your emergency reserve and to make sure you have no outstanding debt. So what I would say is go through this portfolio. And again, you don't have to be 100% out of the market. What you do want to focus on is if you've got too much risk in the portfolio. And if you do, be sure to move some of the money around, free up the money you might need, and don't try to outguess what's going to happen next. You don't know. So be very careful. All right? Isn't that easy? Okay. Ah, Mark, am I good? I always like to think I have a crystal ball, but if I did have a crystal ball, I'd share it with all of you, truly. I really would. Okay? (laughs) It's been a great program. Thank you so much for listening. Throughout the week, we are monitoring our email account. When I say we, I mean Mark. But he does forward them all to me, so I know who you are and where you're writing from. Give us a shout. Ask Jill at JillOnMoney.com. Throughout the week also, if you want to go into the website, JillOnMoney.com, we're constantly updating it. You can sign up for our free weekly newsletter and buy my book. Boy, that's a lot of things I'm shilling right now. Anyway, it's all at JillOnMoney.com. We are always grateful that you listen and spend time with us every weekend. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And we'll see you next week.